The results are in. Apparently, prayer doesn't work. At least that was the conclusion reached after an experiment on prayer at Harvard University. They took 1,800 heart bypass surgery patients and they monitored their post-surgery recovery. A third of the patients had people praying for them and they knew about it. A third of the patients had people praying for them and they didn't know about it. And then the final third didn't have anyone praying for them, at least not as part of the experiment. So do you know what they found? Nothing. No discernible difference in the rate of recovery among the three groups. Apparently, prayer doesn't work. It probably comes as no surprise to hear that the power of prayer sometimes gets called into question. Anytime there's an awful tragedy like a, a mass shooting, if you say that you're praying, it's kind of seen as the same thing as saying that you're doing nothing. It's kind of seen as a cop-out. It's seen as something that's, that's absolutely worthless and doesn't help. And yet, even among Christians, I, I wonder if we've sort of silently come to the same conclusion as the people at Harvard University. Maybe we've spent a significant portion of our lives praying and praying that God would, would take something away or make a problem better, and it just seems as though those prayers haven't worked. This week, I want to talk to you about the power of prayer by looking at another experiment on prayer. This one is recorded right on the pages of the Bible. As we look at that experiment, we'll have the opportunity to ask that question, does prayer really work? I think that's a good question for us to ask. It's, it's good for us to want an answer because testing the power of prayer is really an opportunity to test the one who invites us to pray in the first place. Jesus famously said, Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. But right after inviting us to pray, Jesus said this, Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven good, give good gifts to those who ask him? Jesus is saying, if, if God really is who he says he is, if he really is that powerful, if he really is that loving, if he really loves us more than any earthly father could ever love his child, then we should expect that when we come to him with our prayers, we will receive good answers. And so as we experiment, as we explore just who our God really is using prayer, I can promise you this, you're going to like the results. Prayer comes most naturally whenever the stakes are the highest. In fact, speaking of stakes, let's say you have this thick, beautiful ribeye steak and, and you're hoping that it turns out a nice, juicy, medium rare. Not medium, certainly not medium well, medium rare. I'm guessing you won't say a quick prayer about it. But you get diagnosed with cancer or the company announces that it's downsizing. Then you just might. What's really at stake when we pray? That's the first question we want to consider as we look at this experiment on prayer that we learn about in 1 Kings chapter 18. Here's how it happened. The king of Israel, King Ahab, and the Lord's prophet Elijah were sort of at each other's throats. Each one was fed up with the other, but for very different reasons. Elijah was upset with Ahab because Ahab had led God's people away from worship of the one true God and into worship of a false god named Baal. In contrast, Ahab was upset with Elijah because through Elijah, God had announced that there would be a famine in the land. And in fact, for several years, there had been absolutely no rain in Israel. So Elijah proposes this experiment. Prophets of Baal are going to set up an altar to their God. Elijah is going to set up an altar to the Lord. Both of them will pray and whichever God answers by sending down fire to consume the sacrifice on the altar, that God is the true God. Now, what's important to note is what's at stake for each of the parties in this experiment. For Ahab, he just wants it to rain. <laughs> he just wants rain and the crops that would come along with the rain. But Elijah, 
Elijah wants God's people to turn back to him. In other words, what's at stake for Ahab in this experiment is stuff. What's at stake for Elijah is souls. Just like King Ahab, we might be very quick to pray whenever the stakes are high, when it's our health, our security, our protection that's on the line. But it's then that God would want us to know that the stakes for prayer are actually much higher. That prayer is not just about getting the good stuff that God has that we want. No, prayer is about the soul of the one who is praying. God invites us to pray. God wants us to call on him in every trouble because prayer is evidence that he is our God. And God wants nothing more than to be our God. God knows that all idols, all false gods are worthless and none of them can save us. He said through the prophet Isaiah, There is no God apart from me, a righteous God and Savior. There is none but me. It can be frustrating when the stakes are high and it seems as though prayer isn't working, but it's then that we need to remember that as high as we might think think the stakes are, they're actually even higher. When we pray, we might not always get the stuff that we want, but when we pray, God has the soul that he wants. I must be doing it wrong. Whenever something doesn't work, that's a natural response to have. And in a world that is driven by and obsessed with results and constantly finding new ways to measure those results, when it doesn't seem as though our prayers are working, it's a natural thing to think. Maybe I'm doing it wrong. That issue came up in the experiment on prayer that we're talking about this week. Prophets of Baal had set up an altar to their God. Elijah had set up an altar to the Lord. They were both going to pray and see which God answered. And the prophets of Baal went first. So they prayed and prayed and prayed all morning long. No answer. So then they danced around the altar that they had made. Still no answer. About halfway through the day, Elijah began to sort of taunt them. He said, maybe your God is taking a nap. Maybe he's away from his desk. Maybe you just need to be louder to get his attention. And they listened. Not only did they get louder and louder, but we're told that they actually used swords to cut themselves. They made themselves bleed. And we're told that this was their custom. This was their strategy for prayer. They thought that they had to earn their God's attention and his answer to their prayers. Do you think we might ever pursue the same strategy when it comes to our prayers? That if it doesn't seem as though they're working, we we think that maybe we're doing it wrong. Maybe we need to pray longer or more sincerely. Maybe we need to sort of tidy up our lives so that God is more inclined to give us what we're asking for. In one way, shape, or form, we convince ourselves that, that somehow we need to earn God's attention or earn his answer to our prayers. Let me say this clearly. That is not how prayer works. It's no accident that when Jesus taught us how to pray, he told us to begin with the words, Our Father in heaven. Because of what Jesus has done for us, the God of the universe is our Father. He is as pleased with and as proud of us as any earthly father could possibly be of his children. And so it's no wonder that if we think that we somehow need to earn God's kindness or his favor with with our performance, that he would actually be insulted by that. I mean, if you had a child who thought that the only time you were ever going to do something nice for them was when they did something good first, you'd be insulted too. Jesus actually addresses the proper strategy for prayer when he says this, When you pray, Do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. If it doesn't seem as though our prayers are working, it's not because we're doing it wrong. No, instead, because we know that God is our Father in heaven, 
we can be confident that whatever he gives us is right. Martin Luther once said, All the world thinks that God is the poorest and most dull-witted student there ever was. If he would just listen to us, then all would be well. I don't know if you've ever felt quite that strongly about it, but maybe you have grown impatient and frustrated with God because no matter how much you prayed, God didn't seem to be taking your advice. How specific should we be when we pray? It's interesting to think about that question in light of this experiment that we're looking at this week. On the one hand, you could say that it's very specific. Prophets of Baal had their altar. Elijah had his altar. Whichever God sent down fire to consume the sacrifice on the altar, that was the true God. That's pretty specific. But it's interesting to note that when it came time for Elijah to pray to the Lord, he wasn't that specific at all. He didn't dictate to God exactly what he needed to do. He simply said this, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so that these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. How general is that prayer? Couldn't we say that very same thing no matter what issue we might be dealing with? Lord, however you decide to work this out, demonstrate that you are who you say you are. Demonstrate that you are God and lead people to know that you are God. See, the beauty of bringing our issues to God and sort of leaving the specifics up to him is that it turns out God knows a tad bit more about the situation than we do. He sees the entire picture, not just of our lives, but of the lives of everyone around us, and he knows how to handle each situation the best. We see this perfectly on display in the life of our Savior Jesus. When he prayed to his Father in heaven the night before he died, he came with some specifics. He wanted, if at all possible, to avoid the agonizing suffering that he knew was ahead of him, and yet at the end of that prayer he said, Not my will, but your will be done. You see, prayer is an opportunity not for us to get God to bend his will to conform with ours. Really, it's an opportunity for us to bend our will to conform with his. There's a Christian author who likes to put it this way. He says, God is going to give you exactly what you ask for in prayer. Or he's going to give you what you would have asked for if you knew everything that he knows. The beauty of bringing our issues to God and leaving the specifics up to him is that no matter how God decides to answer our prayers, that prayer of Elijah will be answered. He will show that he is God and he will show that he is good. So does it work? All week long we've been talking about this experiment on prayer between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. We've talked about how Elijah knew the right stakes of prayer. He knew that the people's hearts were on the line. He knew the right strategy for prayer. Unlike the prophets of Baal, he didn't try to earn God's attention or his answer. We've talked about how Elijah knew the right specifics of prayer, how he didn't dictate to God exactly what he needed to do. And so how did God respond? Well, he sent down fire from heaven and it consumed not just the sacrifice on the altar, it also consumed the wood on the altar, the stone that made up the altar, and even the dirt that was around the altar. So does it work? We might look at this story and be tempted to think that if we just imitate exactly what Elijah did, then we'll get the same results. Right stakes, check. Right strategy, check. Right specifics, check. Okay, God, now I want to see some fireworks in my life too. We might be tempted to look at this story and ask ourselves the question, how can I get what Elijah got? But that's kind of missing the point. See, God's whole purpose that day was to demonstrate who he was, to demonstrate what he was like, and as a result, to turn the people's hearts back to him. And we know that it worked. See, there was another prayer that was offered that day. Not the prayer of Elijah, but the prayer 
of the people in response to seeing what God did. When they saw the fire come down from heaven, they they immediately bowed down to the ground in worship and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. So will God do the same for you? Well, in a very real way, he already has. By placing his own son on the altar of sacrifice, by sending down from heaven all of his divine wrath and judgment against sin, God has proven exactly who he is, exactly the kind of God that he is. He's a God of unconditional love. He's a God who punishes his son to spare us. In Jesus, we see exactly what our God is like. And so in a very real way, Jesus is the answer to our every prayer. Paul wrote in the book of 2 Corinthians, No matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. The reality is that we don't need to tinker with and experiment with prayer until we get it just right and and then it'll finally work. No, really the focus is not on the results of our prayers. Our focus is simply on who God is and then the result is our prayers. In Jesus, God demonstrates exactly what what he is like. In Jesus, God says, I am your God. And as a natural response, all God's people simply say, Amen. Did you enjoy this video? Uh, If so, we would love to share even more Jesus with you, even if you have a busy, on-the-go kind of life. Uh, Just click here and you can find the audio version for this podcast along with all the other podcasts that Time of Grace offers.